Memorial Day weekend, and we have a lot of events going on. Check out f4wonline.com front slash Vegas for tickets to Dave and Brian's Q&A, tickets to all three AEW shows, the big dinner, uh, brunch, Ed's wrestling show. And so speaking of the convention, that's where... Party, party, party. Oh, yeah, the sweet party as well. Good one. Yes. Uh, And speaking of the convention, that's where I met our special guest. It was nothing more than a high and by, but our special guest is Brian Danielson, who won this year's uh, Brian Danielson Award, the (laughs) award named after him in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter Reader Awards. Brian, do you remember hanging out with a bunch of folks in Vegas, gosh, probably 10 years ago, uh, chopping somebody's very large belly and then being a part of the little grappling battle with Brian Alvarez and uh, Dan Velton, a.k.a. the Peach Machine? I, w- I was there that th- I was there that thing, and I missed all of That's right. I, I missed – what was I doing? Because I didn't go to Brian's match, and then they did tell me Brian Danielson was there. I do remember this now. But I was in Vegas, too. I mean, go ahead. Well, so, actually, I did see you, Dave. Uh, I, in, in the, so, I remember you and I talking about English wrestling, like British wrestling. Well, we like, were at a, we were at a, a ch- we were at a Chinese restaurant once. I remember yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, but then, yeah, I remember, I remember the Brian Alvarez uh, Peach Machine battle, right? And uh, and yeah, I don't remember much else. I don't re- when you said the chopping somebody's belly. I was like, ooh, no, did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> the, here, here's something that I remember for whatever reason. And I don't know what this says about me, but I think you were you were wearing a reading rainbow T-shirt. Does that sound familiar? Possibly. Oh god. <laughs> oh, so yes, I actually had found that. I wish I still had that shirt. That was one of my favorite shirts I've ever had. But I'm a an avid reader, and I found it at a Goodwill. I'm uh, I'm big into getting my clothes from thrift stores to this day. And uh, and yeah, that was a that was a favorite of mine for a long time. But you know, you move enough times. And you're bound to lose some of your favorite things. Yeah. So as far as um, just going into everything, um, you made a big decision um, last summer, fall, and uh, ended up in AEW. And I know some people, and you, you know, you've talked about this, and we've all talked about this. Some people, when it came to this similar decision, had a very easy time with it. And you did not. Um, you had a lot of different things that were going back and forth. I mean, is there anything, I guess, when you're like weighing these two things that put all more weight on one side than the other, or was it just one day you just said, Oh, try something new. Well, the real thing was the pressure of having to make a decision. I think had my wife not told me like, listen, you've got to give these, both of these people an answer at some point like soon like they're they're kind of waiting on you right and i like i'm just somebody who will lollygag and drag my feet a little bit on making a decision and i was so content actually that that actually made it easier to deliberate even further right where it was just like well you know i have loyalties here this sounds super exciting um so there wasn't necessarily one thing, but when I did the checks and balances as far, as far as like, what do I want from my life? How can I, where would I make a bigger impact and help more people? Like the, the, what would my quality of life be like for my children as far as being on the road? Like, I think one of the, one of the issues, two things that are not related at all would be, I'd be able to spend more time with my family. And then I'd also be able to bleed. <laughs> so it was just like, uh, you know, I, I don't I don't like to di- divulge my um, my conversations with Vince um, at like at all because I know that he's a very private person. But I will say this: one of the things that when I was because I wanted to tell him before I told anybody else, right? Uh, I think I. I yeah, I don't know if I, I don't remember if I told Vince even before I told Tony, but, um, but one of the things when I finally made my decision, I'm like, okay, I'm set on this decision. And so I, and he was kind of asking, asking me why. And I said, you know, and there's part of me too, that just wants to be able to bleed. <laughs> and he, he immediately said, 
Well, I'm sorry. I'll never be able to give you that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so, so yeah, but, and I mean, it's not like I want to do it all the time, but I mean, there's just something, there's something, I, I don't know, incredibly life affirming, uh, about it as strange as that sounds. Would you Obviously, everyone has their own ideas and perceptions about what pro wrestling should be. And, and, and like with me, I always think it should be like a variety of things. But um, and, and obviously you you have whatever it is that you grew up with or liked or whatever, you know, your vision of what your pro wrestling would be. And um, I mean, the, the one thing when I'm watching your matches now, I even my contact you by this was. You look so happy in the ring, okay, which which um, I can't say I noticed at the end in WWE. I mean, certainly at times in WWE, I noticed it. But, I mean, when I watched, like, the Omega match and the Page matches, I just watched and go, like, this guy is so happy in these long matches. Yeah, I, uh, I am. So there's – I experienced, like – very real and sometimes profound joy when I'm wrestling. And, um, you know, some of the, some of the younger guys, especially like after our matches, or, uh, whatever, it's not even the younger guys, but they say like, they'll say things to me after we've wrestled, but like, Hey, any, anything, any, anything that I should have done better, or whatever. And my biggest advice to them is if you can, I mean, it's, ob- it's obviously you always want to get better. But afterwards, don't worry about the things that went wrong or the things that you can fix. Like experience this joy, right? Because it can it can get taken away from you really quick. I found that out. Like I didn't know before I was forced to retire that that my last match was my last match, you know. And I didn't go into that match with a sense of joy at all. And so so yeah, there's been um, a real sense of joy. I'm also like having a lot of fun with the people I'm wrestling and wrestling new people or even like Kenny who I hadn't wrestled in years and years and years or same thing with Eddie Kingston, you know, in the last couple of weeks, uh, I've gotten to wrestle Lee Moriarty and Daniel Garcia. And then this week wrestled Christopher Daniels, which was for me a real treat because I'm kind of a veteran now. Um, but when I, s- like really started on the independence. Christopher Daniels was that veteran to us. He was this guy that we really looked up to and it was really cool for that to be, be full circle this week. I have to bring this up before we go any further, because this is a family situation that it was like, if you talk to him, they would like to hear the story about the King of Indies, which you and I have talked about in the past. And, and it, we would, and it's a weird story in the sense that, um, I'm sitting with Nick Bockwinkle and Red Bastine, you know, and then there's intermission and Nick just takes off. Now, okay, so well, I'll, I'll, I'll set up a little more. Okay, you're wrestling Sp- Spanky, Brian Kendrick, and with and I'm watching it with Nick Bockwinkle and Red Bastine, and they are just loving this match. As everyone in the crowd was, 300 whatever people, and me and everybody, we're loving the match. It's just a match that just clicked. And Nick does say to me, he goes, if I was, when I was world champion, I would love to defend the title against this guy, you know? Um, and, um, and they, and then red actually said that, you know, people of our generation will say that like, Oh, these guys now they're not as good as we were. And he goes, these guys are better, you know, take my word for it. These guys are better. That's all, that's all I know. And then, you know, he goes and goes backstage and then, uh, you could probably pick it up from there. Yeah. So I wasn't supposed to win that King of Indies tournament. And then Nick Bockwinkle apparently, and I wasn't part of this conversation, went and told, told uh, Roland Alexander, who was booking the tournament, that uh, if you don't put that guy over, you're crazy. <laughs> and so talking about me, and which did change the trajectory of my career. Um, I was supposed to lose to Donovan Morgan, I think, in the semifinals. And then um, he put me in and Loki in the finals of the tournament, which was also the finals of the Super 8 tournament that, that year, which was a big independent tournament at the time, probably the biggest um, known independent show at the time. And, uh, and then had me win. And what it really did for me more than anything else was it made me to the 
independent wrestling community make me really seem like a, a true main event guy where I was at the time I was struggling a little bit. I had gotten let go. I was under developmental deal for a little over a year with WWE. They let me go when they bought in WCW. They had all these cruiserweights who had already been on TV and, uh, I was really struggling to find footing. I was getting a lot of bookings, but in like the Vancouver area with a, a Canadian company called ECCW, and but they were paying like seventy dollars Canadian, which at the time was like forty five dollars American. I was going to college. I was working two jobs. Like it was a, a real struggle, and that really changed my career around. Where like oh, all of a sudden I could get paid a hundred dollars a show, and. <laughs> People were bringing me out, and then Roland Alexander offered me a job as the head trainer at the All Pro Wrestling School uh, at three hundred and fifty dollars a week. And I, I was like, I yeah, I'll take it. You know, that's <laughs> it's a great chance to one. I didn't feel qualified as a head trainer um, one when I took it, but and I told Roland that. And he said, you will have help. And we have like this whole kind of guidebook or whatever it is. But I think trying to teach people to wrestle made me a better wrestler, as it does with many people in anything. You know, you try to teach somebody something, you have to know it more deeply. And and so, yeah, that was a, a, that was a real turning, turning point for my career. And then it was also the inspiration, uh, from my understanding, for Ring of Honor. It was. Um, I mean, I know the story very well from from Gabe Sapolsky and uh, Doug Gentry and Rob Feinstein was uh, they watched the tape of King of Indies. And I don't know who was the one of the three, but they all came out of it with the idea of like, there's I mean, the whole tournament. I mean, if you look back at the names, I mean, AJ Styles in the tournament, Doug Williams in the tournament, Samoa Joe's in the tournament, you're in the tournament, Brian Kendrick. Um, eight, um, the, the, who else? Um, Donovan Morgan was in it. Um I'm trying to think of Bison Smith, I think, was in it. Yeah, for sure. Yep, and, Loki and was in it. Loki, of course, yeah. And um, I think that that's the field. Um, those are the key. But anyway, those, those are the key guys, Dan, Christopher Daniels. And so they saw these eight guys and, and just was like, we could build a company around this. I mean, this tournament was great. I mean, it blew my mind how good the tournament was because I didn't realize – that some of the guys, I mean, some of the guys I had seen regularly, but you, you, that was the first time I would have ever seen you live. I'd seen you on tape from, um, when you first started under a mask from San Antonio. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was the first time I'd seen you live and, um, first time I'd seen Brian Kendrick live and first time I'd seen Loki live too. And, you know, it was just like, wow, this talent is like really good. You know I mean? Like I knew you were good, but I didn't know you were good at that level. Good. And, um, but yeah, they, that's what started. And now, you know, Wednesday night, which is probably would precipitate the question is, um, Tony Khan bought ring of honor. And it's kind of like this weird, I don't know if it is for you, but it's just kind of like a weird thing of like, you were the guy among the guys, I can't say only you, but one of the key guys to lead to the start of ring of honor. And here you are, you know, 20 years later and your boss just bought ring of honor. You know, it's just, it's, it's amazing how things happen in wrestling sometimes. It's it's surreal. And I mean, I don't know, life, especially these last couple of years, life feels surreal just in general. And uh, and yeah, I, I, I was, Tony had actually brought up that, that it was a possibility to me a couple of weeks ago. Um, he didn't know if it was going to happen or not. And, uh, and I was like, oh, that's really exciting. But it's also interesting. You know, part of me wonders about there being too much, wrestling on tv already and what is what is it going to look like is it just going to be for the tape library is he like i don't know you know i don't really have any indication of if he starts running say a ring of honor thing what is that even what does that look like i have i was trying to come up with some ideas as far as like what could we do with ring of honor that would enhance aw rather than detract from it or like add another hour of tv or whatever and um then i came up with some ideas but nothing that i was like saw like had solid ideas about but tony tony's a really good thinker about professional wrestling right and i think in a really interesting thinker just in general who can manage to juggle so many things in his mind at once and so uh so yeah i'll be interested to see what it turns out to be yeah, I don't know how he does it because I have gotten to the point where it's like 
um, aside from real life and pro wrestling, I mean, there's almost nothing there. Yeah, and he's doing, and he's doing pro wrestling at a, at the same level as me or more, more for sure, more and the soccer and the football. It's like I don't know anything about, and I love soccer, and and I like football. And I don't know anything about either of them just because I don't have time to know anything about those things because I'm so you know, so like I and, and I'm up all night too. So it's like I just think, and I'm not writing TV shows. I'm just doing a newsletter. But I just think, how can you do like seriously that? fascinates me and then like you know he adds another thing with ring of honor it's like wow you know it's like how is he able to function at this level i mean i know at some point if he's not i'm gonna see it in the tv shows real quick you know because it's you know and i haven't thank god you know and so everything's good so far you know one thing um you know again like when you talk about like your last match um or what you thought was your last match i mean kind of I mean, that was a really interesting thing. So now you've been back now for a couple of years after being told that you physically cannot wrestle and you're back at, you know, not at a level that, you know, maybe you're the best wrestler in the world. Certainly you're in the top tier without a doubt. Um, you know, and, and um, I even know that you at, so at one point doubted like, oh, my may have lost a step. And it's like, I'm watching you. And it's just like, if you have, you wrestle in a way where no one notices it at all. And, um, you know, what kind of emotions were you going through um, when you were out and then when you came back and then to now? Because now it's just like you're allowed to be, the, I, I, I suppose, I mean, just from watching, I think you're allowed to be the wrestler that you want to be all the way. Whereas in WWE, there's, you know, there's just a certain system and, you know, you're great and everything, but it is different. Yeah. So, uh, so the... The emotions from being out. So I was trying to actually become okay with it. And I think I probably would have been. I think things would have been a lot. My life would be very different if they hadn't brought me in as the GM of SmackDown. Because I was forced to be around it. You know, when I had retired, I started thinking like, okay, what are other things that I can do? What are other things that I enjoy? Like that sort of thing. And I started signing up for all these things. So I was uh, enrolled at ASU. In, um, in an environmental program, I had uh, signed up for a permaculture design course that was um, six weeks long to do regenerative agriculture type stuff. And so that was going to be my, my focus. I was like, OK, I have to kind of accept this. And then when they brought me be- brought me in as the GM of SmackDown and I had to be around it every week. And then it also kind of put a halt to my other ambitions i'm not great with technology and so like the idea of doing classes digitally and we're taping some smackdowns on tuesdays so it was like okay you have to fly out on monday do smackdown on tuesday fly back on wednesday that's three days missing of class time so it really kind of put a damper on some of those other things and then i remember specifically i was watching mox actually and aj styles it Mox is, is really interesting when I look at it now, the, the role that he has played in me being where I'm at right now. Um, but I watched Mox and AJ Styles wrestling, and I had to sit ringside for it for whatever the story was. I don't remember exactly. But I watched it, and I was just so, I got so emotionally bothered, like upset, that I wasn't able to wrestle. And at that point, I was kind of thinking that I think I'm fine. And that was the real turning point. And then I went home and I talked to Bree and I was like, hey, I think I think I, I want to wrestle. And she's like, well, you know, you're going to have to prove to them that you can wrestle. So what does that take? And then we like I kind of started coming up with a plan and started working on some things. And yeah, that's where the that's where the story took us. Like you did, I mean, hyperbaric chamber and probably a million other things that I don't know of. But um, is there anything that you think was a turning point physically or do you think that you just probably always could have gone after a a little bit of time off for the concussions? But they were just, you know, they were just squeamish about it for whatever reason, because it's like when we look back and of course we, we don't know long term 
anything. But what we do know is, is that you've been back for a couple of years and seemingly you've had no, you know, major time off. You haven't had big injuries or anything. I mean, you've been, and, um, you know, no memory issues or anything that I'm, you know, that I could tell. Right. And, and so, I mean, is there any, I I don't know, is there any like thing that, that changed or was it now in hindsight, you could go, you know what, I probably could have come back and, um, you know, they just were squeamish about it, I guess. Well, so I think, I probably could have come back. Um, I have done a lot of things, but I am also grateful for that time because, you know, uh, Dr. Maroon, WWE's head of medical, I think did a really good job in a tough situation because that concussion movie came out. Right. Where Dr. Maroon was unfairly, to me, unfairly maligned in that movie because he wasn't the one that like, the um, the doctor, when you read the book, you know, the, the book that the movie is based on from from um, the doctor with, that was talking about CTE, he was like, at first, Dr. Maroon was skeptical of his findings, but then he looked at him and he agreed with him. And Dr. Maroon was one of the people who was going to the NFL and saying, hey, like, hey, he was an advocate for the players. And... Um, but then you can't do a movie about the NFL where you need the NFL's permission and have the NFL be the bad guy. <laughs> yeah. so, so for whatever reason, Dr. Maroon became the bad guy, which is just completely unfair. But, you know, he, he was like he already had the stigma from that movie that he was very self-conscious about because he's been a respected doctor for years, right? And so, so there was that. And then there's also, you know, a greater awareness. And then there is this idea and nobody knew for sure, right? This thing of like, okay, but what happens if he comes back and something bad happens? That's all going to fall on him. Right. And then there was also this idea of I had been dishonest about my concussion history, about the number of concussions and the fact that years earlier I had had four post concussion seizures. And so all of those kind of put together was it was like, okay, we don't know if this is even I didn't know if it was safe for me. You know, I had had concussion experts like at Barrow's Neurological Clinic in Phoenix, they had cleared me to wrestle knowing about my seizures and that sort of thing. But there's also like a trust issue when you're doing wrestling and that sort of thing. And so anyways, I thought, I um, I think Dr. Maroon did a really great job and what he kind of came up, because he saw how hard I was trying to come back and he said, listen, Brian, so I, if you can get, clearances from these all these other specialists what he considered the best concussion um doctors in the country if you can get clearance from all these other doctors i will sign off on you coming back and so that's what i had to do i think it was four specialists throughout the country that i had to get cleared by go and do thorough evaluations all that kind of stuff and one of the things that that really did because i didn't know if those all the because all those doctors were different and all of those doctors had different perspectives on concussions and i didn't know if that if i was going to be able to jump all those hurdles and so doing that also made me more confident so i wasn't like had this nagging thing in the back of my head that was this told me like oh maybe maybe you shouldn't be doing this you know um so yeah that was really the thing and then uh, i went it was it was really emotional for me uh, when I I flew to Pittsburgh and saw I had come out from overseas. I think I was in Bahrain. I flew, flew from Bahrain to Pittsburgh, got to Pittsburgh, had like a seven p.m. meeting with with Doctor Maroon, and then he eventually kind of left because I was there for several hours. But he left me a note, and he, it was a really nice thing because he and I had been through kind of a lot together and then but at the end of it it said finally you're cleared and like I broke down crying so and then we did the announcement the next day which was I think in Dallas Texas and uh and yeah I've been I've been I feel better now at 40 than I did at WrestleMania 30 when I was in the main event of WrestleMania. I felt horrible then. And that was just like, it was neck. It was all these other things. And, uh, and yeah, I feel great. So when you, when you were announced as coming back, I remember hearing from Dave, like Dave, uh, I, I, I was at Dave's that day when he told me, and we both thought, wow, 
this is going to be such an amazing moment. Uh, the way that th- you know he's going to be able to tell this story is going to be awesome. And then, uh, not not to say that it wasn't a great moment, but uh, I think the the comeback at WrestleMania, it just seemed like there was so much on the table that was left to where this story should have been uh, s- really really paramount for that for that uh, that show. And I thought it was good, but I think a lot of people were like, you know. They should have made this the, the story much bigger. The comeback is so big; it's it's this it's this opportunity to connect emotionally with the fan base from from when you left. Did you feel that that was uh, maybe something that could have been uh, uh, done a lot uh, a lot bigger for 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 the fans? So there's, I've cut being. You have to understand being able to come back was such a joy that I wasn't worried about any of that. I honestly, not that I didn't care. I did care. I wanted things to make sense and I wanted, you know, um, but I, in, you know, occasionally things pop into your brain that say like, oh, I wish it were this or it could be better if it were this. And I really um, find that now to be counterproductive for me, and especially in this industry and in situations where you where you don't have the ability to change them. And so I really, after you know, I might have had a little bit of that, but then I also got to be in the ring with um, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, and uh, and. That was super cool for me. Like those, those two guys, and especially Sammy and I have been really good friends for such a long time. And so, yeah, was it the best thing it possibly could have been? No. Um, you know, I think looking back, it'd be easy to say that, that we could have done a better job with that whole thing. I eventually ended up turning heel like six months later, <laughs> or maybe less. <laughs> but, uh, but, which, you know, uh, but, but I don't even. You know, I wasn't even thinking like I was so and I think that was maybe part of the problem. I was so happy to just be back that I was satisfied with anything. You know, it's funny to me when you bring this up, because there were two times in the last decade or so in WWE where I thought they lucked into something. And luck is just a terrible word because both situations were were very bad. One were even worse than yours with Roman Reigns. And. It was it was like when the comeback comes, they're going to have like this. They're finally going to have that baby face that they're looking for. In both cases, the person ended up being heel. And, (laughs) you you know, and it was just like because to me, it's like it's story. You know, your thing was storybook and his thing even more was storybook. And I don't know. I don't know what it says about the audience or WWE or, or what. But it was just like those were the two times where I go, okay, Roman Reigns is finally going to be that baby face that they want to be. And eventually he will. But, you know, because he's a heel and he practically is now. But but um, and then with you and it was whatever, you know, I mean, it, whatever happened, happened. But it was like I just remember those two times, you know, that's like they finally got that guy, you know, here. And uh, and it didn't happen like I expected in either case. But, um, you know, OK, so you've been in. AEW for you know roughly six months now and i mean like what what you know as, as far as um do you do you feel you made the right decision or do you feel you made a a comfortable decision i mean like obviously in a couple of years you're going to be in that same position again i mean do you have any thoughts on that or is it way too soon to say or you know like what's kind of like your mood on on AEW? Uh, I'm having so much fun. So I wasn't on Rampage last night. There was a live Rampage last night. I, uh, and I had such a good day. Like, um, I had incredible conversations with people that I've known for years, with new people, with, I had a great conversation with Billy Gunn. I had a great conversation with Chris Jericho. I had a wonderful locker room conversation that, was kind of initiated by Daniel Garcia and uh, and just some just some fun things. I also feel like I'm I'm being helpful in some ways, right? And so like I'm I'm helping uh, some people get better at pro wrestling. Uh, somebody's been asking me about other things like life related and some and more depression related because I I have a history of experiencing depression and um, 
and so some of that some of that kind of stuff i really feel like i'm i'm useful and i'm surrounded by people that i really enjoy being around and the work that i'm doing in the ring is really fun and exciting for me uh and i've like i'm constantly for example i'm a little bit i don't know if giddy is the right word it might be the right word I'm giddy for the pay-per-view tomorrow <laughs> and not just for like wrestling mocks, which I'm super excited about. But I also just think like, I love wrestling still. Like I've been wrestling for 22 years. I still love wrestling. I'm excited for the show tomorrow. And so, and that's like a, a really fun feeling to have. Like, like I hope, I hope I'm on early so I can just sit back and watch the rest of the show because I think it's going to be really great. Uh, uh, I I like am very excited about the show. I mean, when I look at the lineup, it's it's you know Tony was uh, asked uh, a couple of days ago, and I hadn't really thought about it. You know where where it goes like you know what order are you going to put the matches? And then all of a sudden I saw, oh my god, <laughs> imagine that. And he said it's like the hardest decision for any pay per view he's ever had. And I was trying to like okay, what would I do? And it was just like, and I could make nothing work because it's like you know you want to you know, do it in a certain way. And, and, you know, like there's, there's the, the WA, WWE way of doing it, or there's a traditional way of doing it where you, you know, the least important to the most important. And in either one, it's like, I couldn't determine least important and most important, or, okay, this match is going to be really good. It's like every match is going to be really good in a certain way. And, and, you know, three or four are going to be absolutely outstanding. And how can you follow like your match, the, um, the dog collar match because I'm just figuring what it's going to be a bloodbath. I could be dead wrong, but um, that's my thought. And then the, the three way tag is going to be ridiculous. And then you know, but everything has got Eddie Kingston and Jericho's got some heat, and um, Britt Baker and uh, Rosa. You know, their last match was incredible, and it's it's a very you know you have to kind of you know position that as a strong match coming off of you know their you know their last one, and oh, and we know the. The, the title match is going on last, which is going to be freaking hell for those guys. But then again, it's probably the right thing. Um, the only ones I could think of, I, I, I thought the title match or the dog collar match, and call the dog collar match unsanctioned to explain why it would be out, you know, instead of the title matches because, man, following a bloodbath. So, yeah, it is It is a such a hard card to, like, position everything. And then last night he added that freaking, you know, uh, black and... Um, you know, Brody King and Buddy Matthews with uh, Eric Redbeard and uh, Penta and Pac. And he's like putting it on at like 7 or 7.30. And yeah. he's like, what the fuck? I mean, I mean, it's yeah. like that when he said when he added that match and added the half hour to show him going like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, how are you gonna, like that six man tag is going to be ridiculous because Buddy Matthews, this is like his first match in a new setting. And he's great, as you know. And Pac is like one of the best, you know, sometimes he's unheralded, but technically wise, I think he's one of the best wrestlers I've ever seen. And Pentagon, I, is, you know, no, yeah, go ahead. I, I, I think, I think Pac is, if I were going to have my son wrestle or my daughter, um, if there were anyone that I would, from a technical aspect, who I would want them to emulate as far as everything they do being textbook perfect. Pack would be it more so than me, right? Everything he does is perfect. And it's really funny because I tell him how great he is and he's really shy. Like, you know, sometimes, sometimes he's not, he's been really bragging to people about how he's got a better pistol squat than me. And, uh, <laughs> and yesterday to be fair. So these are some of the things that I like to do in the, in the locker room yesterday, him and I were debating who had a better pistol squat and we've had five contests. He claims he's went, he's won all five. I think I won one, but <laughs> yesterday to prove my pistol squat was better, I did it on the butcher's back <laughs> while he was in like a table position. I did a pistol squat, and um, and back did not try to try to one up that. So I think I won yesterday. So that might <laughs> that would put me at a record of like five and one, uh, one and five. But yeah, but I I, th I honestly think he's he's incredible. But yeah, the show the show tomorrow is really cool. The I do uh, one of the things that I believe is that 
it is easier to follow good wrestling than bad wrestling um, with uh, a couple exceptions. But, and especially because one of the things that I like about tomorrow's cards is that you look at each match and each match is unique, right? Like I'm, I get super excited for like Eddie Kingston, Chris Jericho, because I don't know what it's going to be, but that's going to be completely different than the, the triple threat tag match, which is going to be con- completely different than me and Mox, which is going to be completely different than MJF and uh, CM Punk. So I think as long as the matches are different, it's okay. It's it's actually better to follow great wrestling than it is to follow like a subpar kind of match. What's really hard is to follow something or is to follow something that's so emotionally compelling. And I found that out. Um, the Royal Rumble, that Becky won the Royal Rumble, won the Women's Royal Rumble. Me and AJ Styles had to follow that match. And it wasn't me and AJ's best match by any stretch of the imagination, and the match was too long. But even if it was better and a little bit shorter it was a title match you know if it was instead of 22 minutes if it was 18 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever the people didn't care they were drained after becky won they were so happy right and so um i think that's going to be the hard part so i think the the really tough match to follow from an emotional standpoint is the punk and mjf because to me that's one of the coolest best told stories in a long time, you know, I'm really proud of um, the story that um, Mox and I have been telling, and it's but it's not near. We're not near. Probably, I don't. I don't think we'll be near the finish. You know what I mean? But like, there's a lot more story to tell. And depending, unless he just kills me tomorrow, which I don't, I don't expect <laughs> to happen. But, uh, but, um, but, but, you know, with that. But I think the. The punk MJF stuff has been so compelling that that will be a that that will be a hard match to follow, you know. So, but I will say this: I when I so I wrestled Hangman the first so the first time. This is like I I have so much respect for Hangman Adam Page, and um, you know the first time we wrestled, we never we never touched other than like less than a minute of brawling total. Uh, amongst, <laughs> amongst several TVs, but uh, and then the first time we we really touched in the ring was an hour long match, and not only that, he'd never done a singles match that was over thirty minutes, let alone a sixty minute match, and uh, and he was incredible, and so I really look forward to see what if him and Adam Cole are going on last. I I really look forward to see what they're going to do because I think it's going to be great. So you mentioned the match with with Moxley, and we've talked to to John a bunch of different times, and he's very very anti written promo writers. And you just uh, you I think you were on uh, the the one one of the Masked Men podcasts maybe, and you talked about how you kind of enjoy the writing process and the collaboration process. And I was just kind of wondering, like. Uh, you know, just the differences in in how people approach doing promos. Like, there's, it, it seems like Jericho's more of like a bullet points kind of guy, at least from what he said. Like, can you elaborate a little bit on just how you go about that process versus how someone like Moxley or, or, or Jericho may go about that process? Yeah. So for me, like, I love collaborating. Like, to me, that's um, one of the funnest things about wrestling. Like, I'm not competitive in any way, shape, or form. Like, when I, I love going and doing jujitsu, but jujitsu more to me is like play, right? Like, if, um, you know, throughout human history, before the, the rise of technology and all that kind of stuff, what, what did people do for fun? They, they played music, they sang, they danced, they ran and they wrestled around right like they did it for fun sometimes in preparation for for war so that you would be ready for war or whatever it is but i think it's a natural part of of human beings to to want to do that but not in a vindictive way i like the collaboration right so i like and especially when i'm talking with somebody who um 
so like uh, Robert Evans was my favorite writer, but even so when I was on the creative writing team, man, I, I like a lot of people like bash the writers. I loved the writers. Right? <laughs> so like, you know, we would, I would, you know, we'd go in the writer's room uh, before a SmackDown or something and we'd be waiting for Vince. And to me, we'd just be having a great time. You know, like uh, just having conversations about wrestling and some things about not about wrestling. But uh, what I like too, you know, and it just because you don't have a writer doesn't mean you're not collaborating with somebody. You know, whether it's collaborating with Tony or collaborating with whoever you're doing the promo with or whatever. I like I like that sort of collaboration. I liked when I was wrestling. Uh, when I was doing the stuff with Kenny, I liked the collaboration with him and Don Callis. I liked the collaboration with Hangman Adam Page and all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, um, I'm some I'm somebody who who likes that and thrives on that. Different people, different people have different processes. If you write, a, if you, I like to read writers' books on writing, you know, because everybody has a di- has a different thing. Like Stephen King wrote a great book called On Writing, and he talks about how he kind of starts with an idea and lets his lets his thought process take him. Lets the characters dictate the story. Right, which is fascinating because my favorite um, author, fiction author, growing up was John Irving, who wrote like a prayer for Owen Meany in the world according to Garb, and he is a very structured writer who does bullet points and that sort of thing. So I think we all we all go about it in different ways, um, and and my favorite way is to say like, hey, what if I kind of say this, and then the other person has their input. And then I have my input and then we craft it together into something that, that we both really enjoy. One of the things I know that, you know, you've talked about for years and years and years, you know, um, you know, and being a fan and I know you watched, you know, the, the tapes and things like that of new Japan pro wrestling when they were really, really hot a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I know there was a part of you that wanted to be there, you know, during that period and maybe even during this period. And obviously since you were in WWE at that point, they wouldn't let you, although they probably were going to let you if you'd stayed. But, um, but then the pandemic hit and everything went to hell. And I mean, it, it made no sense for you to sit in a hotel room for two weeks to do one match, you know, nor, you know, especially because you have to be on these TVs, you know, most weeks, uh, but now things are starting to change. And, um, Hopefully, you know, there's going to be no quarantine, Um, you know, just, you know, pass a test before you leave, pass a test when you get there, and then you're good to go. Um, There's going to be a visa issue, I'm sure, but I presume, you know, that at some point that would be taken care of as well. I mean, do you have thoughts of New Japan Pro Wrestling, or is that something that's like, okay, it was I wanted to do it before, but not so much now? No, I I really do want to do um, New Japan, but... I also kind of don't want to do it until fans can cheer yeah. because I think that that's like a huge, I don't know from what I, from what I want out of wrestling, um, just doing it with the clapping. I mean, I'd still have fun. I, I think I'm one of the few people who enjoyed wrestling in the performance center with nobody. I enjoyed wrestling in the Thunderdome, right? <laughs> I, I tend to find myself enjoying wrestling in whatever atmosphere it is. But I think from what I want out of my experience with New Japan, I would, I would want people to be able to cheer, you know? And we, you know, and hopefully nothing happens where things get set back again or, you know, anything like that. And not just because of my pro wrestling, but because of worldwide health, you know? But, um, but I would really want to wait for that. But then, you know, I just, I, somebody brought up to me this idea of me, uh, Moxley and, and two other people doing like, for example, the G1 and, um, these two other people are, are close, close friends of mine. And, and the, the idea just sounded like so much fun and it wasn't anybody in it, it clearly wasn't anybody in New Japan who, who brought this up to me, but I thought like, man, the four of us on tour together, not only just the matches would be fun, but just being there together, like, would be so much fun. So yeah, that that's something that's something I look forward to, but I'm also at a point at right now with the pandemic that I don't get my hopes up for that kind of stuff. Um, 
because you never know you never know what's going to happen next and i'm also very content and satisfied with the work i'm doing now when it comes to um balancing family because like at one point you know the idea in your life of wrestling 180 days a year 200 days a year probably would have been like you know like the panacea of your life and now it's, it's not it, you know it's like you want you obviously want to wrestle and you know i mean i mean it's, it's another one which actually popped into my head when we, when we were going this direction when you see somebody like minoru suzuki who i've been watching a lot of lately um who's 53 54 in, in nagata who's about to turn 54 um and wrestle at that level that those guys wrestle at. You know what I mean? It's just, does that kind of go like, hey, you know what? I'm not that old, and I may have a lot of time left if my body holds up. And, and, and it's not like those two guys worked a soft, easy style. Neither of them did. I mean, you know, Eugene Nagata's worked a hard style for 30 years, and, and Suzuki for over 30 years now. And... You know, it's a different style that, that Suzuki did and different career path, including a lot of real fights. But these guys are, are going strong. And I even watched the other night Tatsumi Fujinami, who is 68 years old, and that may be pushing it. But but what, But what? even with Fujinami, what I would say is in the setting that he was in, he was great the other night because, you know, it's like a six-man tag. He only stews a few trademark spots. And physically, he I don't know how he looks like he looks at 68. I mean, I look at that and go like, oh, there's something, this is, this is because, you know what I mean? It's like, that's just, you know, I mean, he's got legs at 68 and it's just like, what the fuck? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, when I look at those guys, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, before, you know, 40, uh, you know, I want to be, I want to be retired at 40. Uh, I want to be retired at 45. But then when I look at, at those guys and there is obviously a limit at some point, like 70, I'm sure. And probably really 